want to say I've uh, really had a great time uh, getting to visit Hong Kong and have been excited to be here and learn everything that everybody else has been talking about. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing today is talking about cell biology, which is quite different from, I think, any of the other talks. And so really, instead of focusing on this microtubule part of things, I'm going to do spend a lot of my talk um, trying to give you an introduction to modeling in cell biology. Uh, but before I do that, I want to give the acknowledgement, because I have a bad habit of not doing that. And I think it's particularly important here, because the work that I'll be presenting is very much uh, interdisciplinary. So um, this work and, and the broader work in my lab is the outcome of a close collaboration with a mathematician. So uh, Mark Alber um, and I have been collaborating for almost 20 years. Um, and then more recently, we've been collaborating um, with statistician uh, Jun Lee. Um, and then this work is uh, the outcome of uh, three talented uh, students and postdocs at the interface between math and biology. So Eva Morrow and Shant Ma Ma Masarijian are uh, mathematicians who have gained expertise in biology. And Jared Scripture is a biochemist who is getting a master's degree in applied mathematics. Um, and so uh, first, I want to give you an introduction to complex systems and biology with a focus on the cellular scale. Um, a cell, I think, is, as many of you know, is the fundamental unit of life. Uh, but I think it's really important to think about it as, as a self-organized set of nanomachines. Okay? And, and that's an unusual way to think about it, but it really is what it is. So this happens to be one example of the machine that's making the ATP, um, the, the chemical energy that is allowing your muscles to work and your brain to work. Um, but all together, it assembles into, you know, this is a whole cell. You can see some of the substructures. This is the structure that's pulling the chromosomes apart. And it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. So a mammalian cell has got 3 billion different proteins and about 100 uh, cubic microns. Um, just a, one thing I'll point out, if you're interested in any of these numbers, a really excellent source for numbers in biology is something that this Rob Phillips put together. Um, you can get this online. Um, so there's, uh, and this 3 billion proteins comes from about 20,000 uh, protein coding genes, but this isn't everything, right? You've got a myriad other molecules, RNAs, lipids, complex carbohydrates, all to go together to make this dynamic system that is itself. And so the goals um, of my talk today are to introduce you to um, a, a few of the challenges that cell biologists are facing. I'm going to briefly um, kind of touch on a problem that we're working on and how we've been using computational modeling to study, uh, study it, including some um, what I would say are, are uh, not sophisticated from your perspective, but, but uh, for us biologists, uh, machine learning approaches that have been very important. Um, and then uh, I think a major goal is to encourage you to work with your local biological community. Um, there's a wealth of problems that can be cro solved cross-disciplinarily, and um, some of them, I think, don't take particularly sophisticated approaches from your perspectives, but can really make an impact on the biology. So uh, first, um, you know, why would this type of thing be important? Well, I think the two reasons are, are medicine and, and basic biology. So um, medicine, as you know, there's a lot of desire to make more effective therapies. Um, and sort of the present of medicine is evidence-based medicine, where you um, and historically we've taken we as a community have taken reductionist approaches with controlled trials where you change one variable at a time per experiment. But this reductionist approach fails to get the interactions between the parts, okay, uh, or the, of the different parts of a human. And so uh, the future, which is really being developed now, and, and as I think many people have been hearing, there's even been a couple of talks at this conference, especially the. Um, talked yesterday about cancer, where people are trying to get towards precision medicine, where you integrate the range of different uh, types of high-resolution data, for example, the genome, so all of the, you know, the, your, the, the sequence of the individual genome, the metabolome, so the different metabolites, the chemicals that are in the body, the different microbes that are in the body, and then various images um, for, uh, to try to um, get a more precise idea of what's going on. So the hope is personalized therapies. And interestingly, this is giving rise to a new job, which is a clinical bioinformatician. And if you're interested in this, this is actually a really nice review in genome medicine um, that gets at some of these issues. Um, however, for me, I'm more focused on, on these questions or you know, why we've been getting into modeling is from the standpoint of basic biology. So how do cells and organisms really work? Um, so here is a classic movie of a white blood cell. Let's see if I can get my pointer here. There it is, a white blood cell uh, chasing some bacteria. So how is this white blood cell, where does it, how does it know where the bacteria is? How is it moving? You can see it changing its shape. 
um, uh, how is it sensing it? And so, um, you know, these are basic questions which have been asked for a very long time, and we're really at the edge of being able to start to answer them. Okay, so present day biology has done an excellent job of coming up with a parts list. Okay, we don't have all of them yet, but we have most of them. But the future that is really starting to become, be coming now is how to put it all together. And, and so the real desire is to start to make biology predictive. Um, and all of these things together, both for medicine and basic biology, are going to require the involvement of big data analytics and computational modeling. So to give you an example then, let's focus in on the cell. Um, there, there, I'm, I'm going to try to talk about three different examples of, of cell biological complexity and how um, modeling and, and big data are being, being used to try to address them. So one is metabolism. And this is the kind of standard frightening picture of metabolism that I showed in pre-meds in my biochemistry class. Um, what this is is the sum of chemical reactions um, in uh, your, your body. Um, and so the data, then, that uh, people are using to study this process is known as metabolomics. Um, so uh, through a variety of different mechanisms, people can measure the amount of each metabolite, so each one of these chemicals, as a function of time, with or without perturbations. And um, you can get a lot of data out of these methods. And the typical goals of doing metabolomic studies are to compare, for example, cancer cells to normal cells, to figure out, you know, are certain things um, especially prevalent or absent in cancer cells, um, also to compare different cancer types to each other, um, and, and then correlate with genome level changes, and then to do all of this, for example, um, under perturbation, drugs, et cetera, and see how you might be able to, um, uh, to improve the situation. And so approaches for doing these types of studies include network science. You've heard a, a, a really nice talk about that already, uh, actually a couple of different talks. Um, and then people also um, make systems of coupled equations, so with the fluxes through these different nodes. And the outcomes, the reason that people are interested in this is to try to identify vulnerable nodes that you could use to fight cancer or microbes. Um, and then use that to develop small molecules to target these nodes. Okay, but um, so I, I think it seems pretty clear that this is a productive way to go, but there are some challenges to analyzing metabolism as an example, but more broadly, cell biological data sets. Um, one is that data sets tend to be biologically very heterogeneous, okay? And the difficulty is that identical organisms are not identical, and this is something that people really struggle with, okay? So single cell types can be bewilderingly variable. This is known as biological noise, but um, it, it turns out that I think that, that, that a better way to look at this, we biologists tend to get frustrated by this, but the, the real way to look at this is that cell behavior and attributes really are a, a, a distribution. So this happens to be you know, yeast cell growth rates um, in a particular culture at a particular time. Um, these are as close to genetically identical as you're going to get. These are clones, um, and you just see that that's the variability in the growth rate. But biologists, we like to you know, answer one number, you know, report one number, and that one number is just the wrong way to look at these things. Okay, now in addition, what's in some sense even more problematic is that data sets are technically heterogeneous. Um, different labs collect different data sets. They're just not comparable. They're um, co collected with different, um, the conditions are different, you know, the temperature, things like this. Um, there are different softwares used to store it and compare it, and this is, this is a real challenge. Um, and then things that you guys are familiar with about problem, this problem, the data can be very highly multi-dimensional. Sometimes they're very sparse. Experiments are time-consuming and expensive, so sometimes the data you want just doesn't exist. But an additional challenge here, which is again where this community can come in, is the biology community on average is less experienced with computers and coding. And so it's not part of our standard training, and usually we come to it much older, and so just like it's a, a challenge for children to learn languages they're not familiar with, it's a challenge, uh, sorry, it's a challenge for adults to learn languages they're not familiar with, it's a challenge for, uh, uh, for biologists to come to this after the fact. And, and so this is the way our training needs to change. But again, it's where um, the modeling community who is trained in these things uh, can really make an impact because I think it's uh, observationally, it's easier for modelers and mathematicians to learn biology than the other way around. Okay, and uh, so some problems can really be solved straightforwardly and so it's opportunities for you to make contributions. Now, um, for questions re relevant to pharma or medicine, there's some extra challenges and these include intellectual property um, and, and privacy, patient, patient privacy. 
Um, now, let's uh, go to a different example of cell biological complexity. So you might think that a really good thing to do would be to um, do whole cell simulations. And indeed, um, these are starting to come online. Um, in order to simulate a whole cell, instead of just, for example, the metabolism that we were looking at, we've got to start considering space, okay? So there's position in space um, of particular molecules. Um, you, for example, um, you might have this a wall out here, and the DNA at the center. Um, you've also got to consider diffusion and other motion. A bacterium is about two microns by one micron. Diffusion isn't as significant there as in a mammalian cell, but um, even in, in bacterial um, models, they're, they're having to worry about diffusion. Physical forces also become very important. And so um, what is happening is that people end up having these hybrid models. Uh, now, there are, however, some you know, challenges to simulating these. There's some really big challenges, OK? First, there are, can be an enormous number of parameters. Um, we really lack key quantitative information, um, in part because the experiments performed um, in test tubes are not relevant to the cellular environment. Um, and often, there's no practical way to measure the quantity of interest. Um, but, so what people end up having to do is just optimize the parameter against existing data, but that can really be highly imperfect. Um, and in addition, many reactions, so the link between nodes, are, aren't yet known. And as a result of all this, there's a need to coarse grain, um, but it's really sometimes hard to know how much is too much. And this is a case where um, the awareness of the relevant biology is really important. So if you are um, a, a modeler involved um, in a collaboration like this, this is, I, I think, often where um, the, 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 you, you really have to um, kind of fight through the collaboration and make sure that, that um, this is really being set at the right level with, with the coarse graining because um, uh, this is, it can, you can lose a lot of the biology there, but it's necessary to coarse grain. Now, um, because modeling a whole cell can be so complicated, it, there's, there's some nice work that's been done with uh, bacteria um, uh, by, by, for a, um, a package called a lattice micro, but a mammalian cell is about 100 times larger than the bacterium. Um, and as yet, um, the biology that has come out of these um, uh, whole cell simulations it, it hasn't really been so useful yet because it's at its beginning. And so right now, most of the effective simulations uh, are really for cell biological subsystems. And I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to one of those um, for some of the work that we're doing. So the cytoskeleton is one of these subsystems. Okay, and it's a dynamic network of protein-based fibers and molecular motors um, that does a number of, of, of kind of interesting and uh, dramatic things. So um, it divides the chromosomes. Here's a picture of um, something called the mitotic spindle, which is pulling the chromosomes apart. Um, it generates force and movement. So here is a movie of a cell that's cross crawling across glass. Um, um, and it also organizes the rest of the cell. This happens to be some membranes, you don't need to know what kind they are, um, that are um, you know, sort of at the center. Each one of these cells is different, but you can see that there's a similar localization of these yellow membranes in all of these cells. Okay, and so some questions about the cytoskeleton that, that um, are important to me and to other people who study it are, is how does the cytoskeleton assemble? Okay, it's, a, it's actually a self-assembling system. You can take the parts of it into a test tube and it will assemble and you can get structures like this to assemble in a test tube if you have the right parts. Um, how is the process regulated? And how can we use um, this understanding um, for engineering and or health? And this is a case where the standard reductionist cell biology um, is not sufficient. So the idea that if you you know you know the properties of the parts, you can figure out how it all fits together because it's just too complicated. We need a fusion of biology with physics and computer simulations to try to answer these questions. And so the particular part of the cytoskeleton that I work on is called microtubules. Okay? And so microtubules, um, let's see. Microtubules are non-covalent biological polymers of a protein that happens to be called tubulin. Okay, and they're actually hollow tubes. Okay, I'll show you another structure of a microtubule on the next slide. Um, right now, let's just focus on the big picture. So they function as train tracks for motors. Okay, so they're quite literally molecular motors that run up and down on microtubule structures. Um, and and um, they also are in that structure that I was uh, showing you is pulling apart the chromosomes. The combinations of the microtubules and these motors pull them apart. 
Um, if you've got a nucleus, okay, if you're a eukaryote, you've got microtubules, so they're everywhere. And they display a surprising behavior that is a dynamic instability. So uh, what they do is they grow and they shrink, okay? So normally, if you might think about trying to, to polymerize something in a chemistry lab, you take some subunits, you dump them in a test tube, and you'll, it'll grow, and then you'll, you'll, reach a, you'll reach some final state where nothing much more is happening. And if you look at those individual polymers, you know, maybe a subunit comes off, a subunit comes on, but it's a pretty boring system. Instead, the microtubules, if you look at them in a test tube, one is growing next to one that's falling apart. And that's a surprising behavior. Okay? Um, but one thing that is key to understanding that behavior is that the polymerization requires chemical energy. And the chemical energy happens to be in the form of something called GTP. You don't really need to worry about what it is. It's like um, ATP, which most of you have probably heard of. It's just chemical gasoline. Now, if we go back to this issue of the growing and shortening, you can map that out. You have the length versus time. You see it grows, it suddenly falls apart. It grows, it grows, it suddenly falls apart. This is uh, an approximately random process. Okay, and so um, we study how microtubules assemble, how this assembly is regulated, and, and and the mechanism of this dynamic instability behavior. Now, um, I'm going to talk about some of the simulations that we use to study this, but first it would be helpful to know a little bit more about what a microtubule actually is. So um, these microtubules are 13 protofilaments that range from the hollow tube. Um, they've got uh, two ends, okay, so this is a polar structure with a head end and a tail end, kind of like a bunch of people standing on each other's shoulders. Um, there's an end that tends to grow faster, one that grows slower. Um, but the key thing to realize here is that um, these subunits bind this energy molecule, and then shortly after they attach to the end, they will hydrolyze or break or burn that energy molecule. And so that gives um, the kind of basic textbook model for the mechanism of dynamic instability. The idea is that as long as these subunits have the little red energy molecule here, then those subunits are tightly bound to each other, um, kind of like the, top, the, the ring around, the metal ring around the top of a barrel. But if you lose that so-called cap of GTP subunits, the thing blows up, kind of like an exploding banana. And the basic idea then is that the subunits with GTP have these strong lateral bonds, but the subunits without the GTP, after the energy has been used, then um, they want to blow up. Well, why would they want to blow up? Well, the basic idea is that the energy is used to destroy the microtubules. So after you've burned the energy, then that energy is now in the lattice. It's a lot of strain. And so the, the microtubules under strain down here. Um, what is the purpose of this energy use? It seems kind of crazy, right? You've got all of this energy being used with the microtubules are growing and shortening. That's a waste. But whenever you see something that looks like a waste in biology, you know it's actually something very important because organisms don't want to waste energy. Um, this ensures that the cytoskeleton is dynamic, okay, and it allows the cytoskeleton to respond to signals and self-organize. Okay, so um, one thing that I should have explained at the beginning is that I'm really a biologist, okay, I'm a, I'm a cell biologist in a chemistry department. I'm here talking to you guys about uh, the work we've been doing with modeling. So how did I get into this? Well, my long-term interest is in the microtubule cytoskeleton and cell function. We work on microtubule binding proteins to understand how they alter microtubule dynamics and how they, uh, you know, what the mechanism of that effect is. And the reason are things like cancer. Some of the best anti-cancer drugs attack the microtubule cytoskeleton. Um, neuro neurodegeneration um, often involves microtubules um, and just basic cell biology. And we work on some proteins like this thing that's um, just dynamically tracking the microtubule ends here that happens to be called CLIP-170. But in the course of this work, we ran into some problems. So how do you make quantitative predictions about the effect of one of these binding proteins on the dynamics? Um, and in fact, how can you make quantitative predictions about tubulin itself? Um, that you could do experiments, but there were no good mathematical models out there. And so what we ended up doing, and this collaboration that started with Mark Albert uh, more than 15 years ago, was to try to use computational modeling to address these questions, and specific to gain an intuitive feel for a system of dynamic microtubules, and then develop and test mathematical models. And so ongoing efforts in my lab include um, trying to understand, uh, for example, how the chemistry of the subunits um, relates to um, the dynamic behaviors of the individual filaments and then the, the behavior of the population. So to try to get a multi-scale understanding of this, 
and to look at the mechanism of microtubule binding proteins. But today, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some work we've been doing on the mechanism of dynamic instability. So um, we have two simulations, um, and they uh, operate at two scales, and they have different, uh, different applications. So we have a simplified uh, or microscope scale model, okay, Mark Albert would call this a mesoscopic uh, uh, kind of middle scale model, where we model the microtubules as simplified linear polymers. We basically just imagine that we don't know anything about the fact that they're, um, that they're you know, 13 protofilaments and it's just like we're looking in a microscope and so we've got a linear polymer. And so we can use this to look at the basic behaviors of systems of dynamic microtubules. And so, for example, our first paper on this was looking at the impact of the physical environment back in 2006. Um, but actually, the paper we're in the process of submitting has gone back to using this, this simple model that we originally built as a toy model. It turned out that there was a lot of biology that fell out of it. Um, we also have a detailed molecular scale, or microscopic model, where we um, model each subunit explicitly. Okay, and we use this to look at the mechanisms of those dynamic instability transitions, so why the microtubule falls apart or starts going again, and the mechanisms of binding proteins. Now, I will contrast this to the, uh, the really nice talk you heard this morning on molecular dynamics, right? So this is a case where we're coarse graining. Each one of these uh, microtubule proteins, which itself um, is a, a complicated um, uh, structure that that you could, um, and, and some people do model through molecular dynamics, but, but basically with the things that we need to look at, we simply can't keep track of the molecular dynamics. We have to coarse grain it to the point that each one of these subunits is just a ball. But I think that um, we are able to get actually a lot of important information out of that. So it's, there's no need to go to the level of molecular dynamics here for this particular system. Now, both of these models, there's a set of user-defined input parameters, and importantly, these input parameters um, correspond to uh, what either is set by um, evolution, so for example, the biochemical characteristics of the subunits, uh, or by the experimenter. So um, it's you know, the, the volume that you're working with, um, the, the number of templating sites, the, and the concentration of subunits you've got. And then the emergent parameters, the things that come out of the simulation, are exactly what would come out of an experiment. So the individual microtubule behavior, so those di dynamic instability um, uh, characteristics, so the growth and shortening rates and the transition frequencies. Um, also, the population level behavior, the amounts of polymerized tubulin and free subunit. Okay, so, um, so this is one way in which this is a multi-scale model. Experiments can capture this, and experiments can capture this, but it's actually extremely difficult to make experiments capture both of those at the same time. In fact, I'm not aware of an experiment that has done that. And so um, these simulations can each simulate uh, systems of dynamic microtubules for hours and simultaneously follow individuals and populations, which is um, very useful for the work that we do. So uh, to then pursue this example then of using simulations to look at the mechanism of dynamic instability. So we have some questions. So why does a growing microtubule suddenly fall apart? Okay, um, and so we might say, oh, the GTP cap is lost, but what really is a GTP cap? You, this isn't a solid, this is an image from one of our simulations. It's not a solid structure as is drawn in textbooks. And in fact, the solid structure drawn in textbooks doesn't really make any sense. Um, so, you know, it's really not clear what happens here. And then even less clear is how a depolymerizing microtubule can suddenly start growing again. Okay, what happens there? Um, now, as a, a thing this to kind of uh, bring it back to relevance to other systems, you say, well, can understanding microtubules tell us anything about similar behaviors in other systems? Now, th this in some sense is a stretch, but actually I think that there is a deeper similarity here than might seem. Um, the behavior of the stock market actually has a lot of similarities, right? So it's growing until it isn't growing again. And then you can usually look back and figure out, oh, well, this is the point where it started to fall. But when you're in the middle of it, it's a little hard to know that it's about to collapse until it's already collapsing. And that's actually extremely similar to what we're dealing with here. Um, and they're both cooperative systems. And, and then we could, we could talk more about that later. But um, I, I think it's an interesting analogy. The key thing to, to come back, though, to the microtubules is that the study of process, you have to quantify it. 
Okay, and what is the typical approach used uh, by cell biologists and biochemists to quantify microtubule dynamics? Well, we assume that they're just two states. It's either growing or it's shrinking, which yeah, it seems reasonable from looking at data like this. Uh, the transi transitions are instantaneous, which again seems reasonable from looking at this scale. Um, and the, the velocities, okay, the, grows, the growing velocity and the shortening velocity are founded by fitting lines to the relevant phase. Okay, the noise is ignored. So you, you know, if that's what the original data looked like, you just draw lines and you get angles and velocities out of it. But what if the noise is informative and the transitions are not instantaneous? Um, and so uh, we wanted to look back at this in more detail for two reasons. One is with the simulation, we can get um, basically complete information. And two, the experiments have now gotten to the point that, um, that with better cameras and things, that we can get this temporal resolution much, much better than used to be possible in the past. And so here's an overview of our approach to try to ask this question of whether or not you know, the noise might be informative and maybe transitions aren't instantaneous. Uh, and again, um, this, uh, this approach was developed um, in collaboration and under the direction of our statistical collaborators. So we wanted to use an adaptive, iterative method um, to segment the linked history data and try to extract uh, the behavior data. And I'm going to give you some more details in a moment. Right now, this is just an overview. And then use an unsupervised machine learning approach uh, to let the behavior data tell us how many different microtubule states there are. So are there just growing and shortening, or is there something else? Um, and we wanted to develop the method using the simulation data uh, because we know exactly what's going on in the simulation. Um, one problem, though, is that the simulation may not reflect the real system, right? We think it does. We've built into it as much biochemistry as we can, but um, it may not be accurate. Um, and then once we have this de method developed, okay, we want to apply it to experiment data. Um, the reason to start with the simulation is that the experiment data is actually limited. It's, it's difficult to get enough experiment data for these statistical methods up here. Um, there's also limited temporal and spatial resolution. And so after we've developed the method here, we're going to try to apply it to experiments and see if we see the same behavior with real microtubules. And so two key questions are, are there two behavior states, growing and shortening, or more? And are the transitions instantaneous? And the reason for asking this is to see if we can use this information to get the mechanisms of the transitions. So, um, so here now, we'll give a little bit more detail. So um, here is um, the actual data from the simulation. Um, and so we're going to try to extract the behavior data. So um, what we're going to do is use an adaptive iterative method, so a piecewise linear approximation, to segment the linked history data. And this is an outcome of if you have that same uh, uh, linked history plot after this uh, piecewise linear approximation has uh, been applied to it. Um, and then we're going to quantify these behaviors for each segment. So the velocity, the um, height change, so basically how long it is, or, or how, how much the microtubule change the length, and also the time duration. Okay, and then after that, okay, so, so here's just the, the process of extracting this. Okay, and then we're going to classify these slopes as positive, negative, or zero, where zero is basically, there are very few that fit into that category, and it's just to, to separate the data. Okay, and then once we've got this set of all of these um, uh, segments, and so for uh, one of the long simulations, we'll get about 10,000 of these segments. Uh, we're now going to provide, a, 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 a apply an unsupervised machine learning uh, approach um, to try to let the machine tell us how many different microtubule states there are. And the approach that our statistical collaborators thought would be most uh, useful in this particular situation is something called k-mean clustering, which I think lots of you are much more familiar with than certainly I was at the beginning. But the basic idea is that um, at k-means clustering, um, you have determined that there are some number of uh, clusters by an approach called the gap statistic. Um, which I'll show you some data for in a moment. And then once you've got, you've found the optimal number of clusters, you uh, assign a particular data point to a cluster by uh, how close it is to the various centroids of these clusters. So the basic idea with gap statistic is you're looking at the first, um, the, the, um, the, the first local maximum. And so um, this is an example telling us um, with reasonable certainty that, that there's uh, you know, three and not more groups 
Um, it's also not one, okay, so there's kind of two to three of these positive, types of positive slopes. Um, and here's just what the data look like. You've got, um, you've got these blue ones, which are really quite different from either of these two greens. We have dark green and light green. So these are, this is an example of the three clusters that are identified for the positive slopes, so the growth slopes. Okay, and so the conclusion here is that there's not one type of positive slope, okay, because it's quite clear that, that, um, that one is not the optimum, uh, but there are, there are three, okay, so two to three. So, fine, do the results make sense? Okay, so here is a link history plot um, from the simulation. Okay, um, the white is the simulation data. I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see here, but it's fitting reasonably well. The black is then the fitted line segments. Um, and the colors are these different um, uh, segments, okay? Excuse me, the different classifications um, that the K-means cluster even applied. And actually, it does look like it, you know, makes sense, fine. You've got green or growth, um, you've got um, uh, reds, which are depolarization, and then you've got these sort of blue things in the middle. So this is just, um, thus far I only talked about growth data. What does it look like if you put all the data together? Well, what you see is that for both growth and shortening, there are actually three different um, classes, okay? There are, um, actually that should say classes, not velocities. There are two velocities that are similar, okay? So you've got two similar types of shortening. You see that um, you've got two types of shortening here. The velocities are the same. Um, you've got two types of growth here with very similar velocities. And then importantly, um, you've got for each growth and shortening, one that is definitely smaller. Okay, and we're calling this stutter. So on this scale, it's a little hard to see that this is um, a smaller value than here, but it, it definitely is. Um, and then shortening is much faster than growth, and you can see the dramatic difference between um, the, the, the uh, down stutter, okay, or the, the depolarization stutter um, from a regular depolarization. Okay, and so this was actually quite significant to us. Okay, so it told us that there's gro there growth and shortening phases as expected, but there are two previously unrecognized behaviors, up and down studies. Now interestingly, biologists have seen these before, but we haven't known how to categorize them because everybody just knew if you categorize things as growth and shortening. And then you could say, oh, well, let's see if maybe there, we'll, we'll define the idea that stutters exist, but how do you know that this isn't just part of a continuum, right? Here we have a case where the statistics have argued that there really is a state that is uh, straightforwardly distinguishable from the other states. Now, interestingly then, to get to this question of mechanism, the stutters tend to precede catastrophe. Um, and so uh, you can kind of see that a little bit here. Here's a catastrophe, okay? You get a kind of a bluish color before the catastrophe. Here's another example where, in fact, there was an unusually long stutter uh, before the, the, it fell apart. Okay, and in fact, if you quantify this, you see that, um, that, that more than three quarters of the catastrophes were transitional, which means that there was a stutter that preceded them. Okay, fine, that's what the simulation looks like, okay? Um, does this tell us anything about mechanism of catastrophe? Well, let's wait to see what the real data look like. And in fact, the real data gave us similar results. Okay, you see that there are stutters that are also existing in the real data. Um, you know, that you've got um, also up stutters and down stutters. One thing that's a little different about the real data is that there are again two types of growth, but in fact the short growths are faster than the long growths, and um, we have a mechanistic reason for thinking that that might be real. And in fact, we can see that in the simulations if we uh, change the way we keep track of the length of the microtubules. So I think this is, um, I think there's actually something important here. But the key thing for our talk today is that real microtubule catastrophes also often occur through stutter. Uh, the numbers aren't quite the same, it's more half and half, uh, but um, in any case, uh, this is very encouraging to us because it suggests that, that we are able to start understanding, well one, it's good because the simulation and the, and the real data are, are matching actually pretty well. The, the second thing is, and this suggests that we can start looking at the mechanism of the catastrophe. So what is tipping the tip to fall apart? Uh, and the approach is we're now trying to correlate the behaviors uh, as seen here with the structure of the microtubule tip. Um, so asking what structures correspond to stutter. So here, for example, the growing tip, that's a stuttering tip. It doesn't look so different, does it? 
So um, we're trying to figure out what the relevant variables are and how to quantify and compare them. Um, and then the idea is that we will use simulations to guide the experiments, um, and importantly, the experiment interpretation. Let me show you what the experiment looks like. This is a simulation. This is an experiment. It's actually, uh, you know, we don't have anywhere near the resolution that you have here. Um, you see that this kind of looks fat. Well, that's just an artifact of the, the way the cameras work. Um, uh, this is a protein that is thought to correlate with the GTP uh, concentration, though. So we do have some information that we can use to try to correlate experiment with simulation, but this is really why the simulations are important. So um, with that, then, I'm going to go ahead and just give you, I'm going to take a step back now and give you some major conclusions, okay? So the kind of specific conclusions for our work were, again, we think that we're able to use the simulations to really tell us something about how um, the microtubule tip is working. But for you, I think the conclusions are, are, should be broader. And, and so there are actually lots of applications for modeling in cell biology. Okay, so our work, we've been using combined simulations and modeling to gain insight into how microtubules work. And uh, in some other work we haven't shown you, we've been looking at trying to understand multi-scale modeling to, to see how the biochemistry of the subunits um, relates to uh, these, these uh, medium and large scale behaviors of, of the population uh, and the, uh, excuse me, of the individual filaments in the populations. But um, I think that the reason that it's, it's very important for biologists to be uh, active in, in meetings like this is that uh, this really is being able to harness modeling really is the future of cell biology. Because um, we've got to put all these parts together. Um, and, and try to take biology from a descriptive science into a, a, a prediction-based science. So there's going to be both a major role for computational modeling and for big data analytics. Okay, I haven't really talked about this at all today, but there's some really stunning microscopy that is starting to come online where people can get um, uh, images, for example, of developing embryos in three dimensions over time. You end up with terabytes of data, and uh, this is a real challenge to try to analyze this type of thing, but it really is the foundation needed to um, go not just from understanding a cell, okay, but to understanding an organism, so how organisms develop things along this line. Okay, so with that, I will go ahead and be happy to take any questions um, and uh, hope to get you out to your lunch so that you can enjoy your last day in uh, Hong Kong. Just uh, yep. um, can I ask one question. We do the k means to do the classification. So typically, how how many uh, categories do you have to do this kind of k means? Um, what we were I'm not sure what you mean by categories of uh, types. Uh, uh, types. Yeah. So um, the uh, the three variables. Okay. So so we um, put in the, the there was a three dimensional space. So we looked at the the velocity, the yeah. length of time. Um, and also the length that the microtubule grew, which might sound like redundant data because, of course, a velocity is a rise over run, right? But it turns out empirically that we need that three-dimensional information to, uh, to actually get the, um, to, to, to come up with an effective classification. Oh, sorry. So how many types do you, uh, how many groups do you have? Um, oh, three. Okay, so uh, for of the um, so as you actually saw to go briefly back to the um, uh, well, I, I won't go all the way back. But when we ran the gap statistic, the gap statistic showed us that that one was definitely not the answer for growths. Okay, but it was it was a little bit wishy washy between two and three, and that makes sense because uh, what it is is that there were two different types of growth that had the same velocity. Yeah. Okay, but um, and then there was one that was much slower. So um, it was clear that it's not one as the biologists had previously thought, but it was two or three. Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I have more questions. Uh, if there is no more questions, thank you for speaking again.